Second is the theories of the market. So to show how the fact that how we conceptualize how markets work depends on how we think about how firms function. Third, just very shortly about development, because you already had two lectures about it with Ustain and Vasiliki. I'll just tie big firms to development. And then finally, regional development as, in, as the geographical aspect of all of this. So, starting with firms. Okay? There are many theories of the firm in, in <coughs> economics, both in mainstream economics, or, uh, in kind of incipient uh, Austrian theories of the firm, evolutionary resource based, and so on. But I will here only focus on the standard theory of the firm in mainstream economics and on what you can call the evolutionary theory of the firm. Now, as for the standard theory, and probably a lot of you will be uh, aware of it, and those of you who aren't might soon become aware of it and learn about it. Uh, it's, of course, I'm referring to the theory which looks at the relationship between the revenues and the cost of a firm. So what this theory says is the following. If you have a firm that produces a certain product, and it cannot affect the price of this product in the market, and it can sell as much as it wants in the market, the firm will not naturally have an incentive if it wants to maximize profit. It will naturally have an incentive to produce as much as it can and just sell everything that it can on the market. Just that alone would imply that the firm would continue growing and growing and growing and producing more. But the other aspect of this theory is, as probably a lot of you know, is looking at the cost of production. So the theory looks at how will a firm decide how much it wants to produce based on what it can earn and how much it costs to produce the goods that it sells. And crucially, this theory assumes that cost, the marginal cost of production to the cost to produce the next unit of production rise as you produce more and more. And for those of you who are economists, that's the rising marginal cost curve. So the first unit might cost 10 to produce, the second one cost 11, the third one cost 13, and so on, until you come to the point where the cost to produce a good is the same as the price for which you can sell it. There's no point in growing after that point because you will be losing money. Now, and obviously there's no point in producing less than that because you could still then produce more and earn money. Now, as I said, the crucial assumption here is that there is, I mean the crucial consequence of this, at least for this lecture, is that there is some sort of a limit to how big fir a firm can grow. Now, but let's look at some actual sizes of some actual firms in reality. So if you go to the Fortune Global 500 list, which is the Fortune's magazine's list of 500 biggest listed corporations in the world, you'll see that the biggest corporation on that list is Walmart, with a staggering 2.2 million employees, by far the biggest firm in the world, and probably the third biggest employer in the world after the Chinese and US militaries, has revenues of about $485 billion and profits of about $16 billion. The aggregate for the entire Fortune 500 list, that's just 500 companies, to, to make that clear. The combined revenues are $31 trillion, $1.7 trillion in profits, and 65 million employees. There's just 500 firms. Now, obviously there might be something wrong in a theory that says there is a limit to how big firms can grow if we then look at reality and we see that some firms have grown to gigantic sizes and they seem to be doing well. Okay? They're not losing money, they're profitable. Uh, now, of course, the mainstream standard theory, you'll hardly find a mainstream economist who says, yes, this is exactly how firms work. Uh, so, so that's not the point. But the point is it still does uh, inform, at least in the public debate, in our minds, the way we perceive how firms work. That if firms grow over a certain size, they won't be profitable, they'll be inefficient, they'll be sluggish, and so on and so forth. So what's the problem in this theory then? Well, the first question we can ask is, do costs of production actually rise as you continue growing? And Aitman and Guthrie, uh, two economists, did a survey in the 50s uh, and published the results in an article called The Shape of the Average Cost Curve in the American Economic Review. I wonder if you could publish today uh, such a survey-based article in the AER, but okay. And so they sent the survey to, to uh, a large number of U.S. companies, and they said, it's a bit more complicated, they, they phrased the question in a proper way, but they said, assume that within a month you need to increase your production, can you tell us which of these cost curves best approximates what happens to your costs? These are marginal costs. So obviously, as you grow, will your costs grow, will they fall and then grow 
Will it continue falling? Will it flat out? And so on. Now, 3, 4, and 5 are broadly in line with uh, the idea that marginal cost of production grow. 6 is somewhat in line with that, but only when you hit the very maximum of your capacity. So it really becomes difficult to squeeze more production out of your factory. <coughs> and then 7 implies falling marginal cost. So the more you produce, the less it costs per product to produce it. Now, don't take my word for it, but as far as I remember, about two-thirds of the company, about a bit more than half of the companies chose 7 as the best approximation of their costs. And then about a third more chose 6. But uh, one firm, for example, made a comment that it's six if we have less than two weeks to expand production. If we have more than two weeks to expand production, then it's seven. Basically, we need some time to adapt our production facilities for a large amount of production. So essentially, more than two-thirds of the firms say, apparently, they do not conform to what the standard theory of the firm would say. Now, Alan Blinder, an economist, uh, did similar research in the 90s. I'm still waiting for the book to arrive. But I do know from a review that they concluded that about 80, I mean, he did a much wider research than this, but they concluded that about 88% of the firms in the US work, work with constant or falling marginal costs. Now, this then really puts a question mark at the theory which says that marginal costs rise and limit the size of the firm. So, in reality, there doesn't seem to be a limit to how big a firm can grow, at least not a limit imposed by costs of production. But are there other limits, possibly? Well, if you're going to read... Ah, I seem to remove it. Oh, okay, I can say it. If you want to read one book on, on uh, how firms function, you should read The Theory of the Growth of the Firm by Edith Penrose, which is perhaps the key book in this evolutionary theory of the firm. And Penrose goes through, among other things, goes through a number of these reasons that are given for why a firm cannot grow above a certain size such as rising costs, limits to market size, and so on and so forth, and argues that none of them are actually true. Or rather, they may be true, but they can be overcome. So why would costs rise, for example, in the first place? The most standard explanation is because of what's called diminishing returns to management. So as the firm grows, it becomes more difficult to manage an increasing amount of production, and more uh, mistakes are made, and hence your costs rise. This is the explanation that the standard theory normally gives for why costs rise. But then Penrose says, yes, that is a problem, but it can be overcome. You can introduce divisionalization in your company. You can separate day-to-day -day management from strategic decisions and so on. And she goes on through a number of other things and shows that there is no limit to how big the firm can grow. Though there may be a limit to how fast it can grow at any point in time, but that's a different matter. So essentially, uh, there doesn't seem to be any limit to how big a firm can grow. And we see that when we look at the biggest firms uh, in capitalist markets. Now, how does this then relate to how markets function? Okay. Again, there are many theories. The Austrian theory, the Austrian way of looking at markets as a mechanism to transfer information through price changes, uh, many theories in mainstream economics, uh, et cetera, et cetera, transaction costs, and so on. Again, I don't have enough time to go through all of that, so I can focus only on the model of perfectly competitive markets and the way actual capitalist markets work. And again, you will hardly find a mainstream economist who thinks that the perfectly competitive market model would claim that this model actually explains how markets work. Okay? Of course, they will say, well, obviously, there are imperfections, there are blah, 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 and so on. But it still informs, again, our way of thinking. What does this model say? Well, it says, many of you will be familiar with it, you have lots of small buyers and sellers, so no one can affect the price. Everyone's a price taker, so the market, everyone takes the market price as given. And then if the price goes up, more firms come into the market, produce more existing firms, produce more, that increases supply, which pushes the price down. Or if, for example, there's increased demand, that gives a signal because the price goes up, that gives a signal to produce more and vice versa if, uh, if, if demand falls and so on. So essentially, the changes in the market price, which cannot be affected by an individual agent, give signals to producers and consumers what to do. This is one crucial assumption, that everyone's a price taker. The other one is that there are no barriers to entry or exit. So anyone can come in and produce, or you can leave in, uh, uh, the market whenever you want. There are many other assumptions here, and we could question all of them, but these are the two I will focus on. And as you might expect, 
uh, the, uh, the question that I will ask is, well, if we know that there are huge firms, how does this affect the theory which sees capitalist markets working as kind of firms jostling, uh, entering, leaving the market, and kind of following the market price? And the question that we uh, need to ask first is, when a firm grows, okay, and we know that it can grow, there won't be any limit to that, will it uh, gain a competitive advantage or disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis its smaller competitors? Now, this is where the kind of influence of the standard theory of the firm comes in. Not that people will remember the models, not that people will study it in any detail, but the idea that small firms are somehow more efficient, more agile, more competitive than big firms is very much present. But in truth, it's the opposite. Big firms have a large number of advantages over small firms in almost any aspect of business. Okay? Uh, First and foremost, and I will list a few of these advantages. First and foremost, they have a cost advantage. Cost that, well, we saw that as you go, as you grow, your costs will drop of production, and this mostly comes from fixed costs. So there are large. When you grow, you have to invest in your machinery, in expensive software, in buildings, or whatever. These are mostly fixed costs, upfront costs that you have to pay, and they're the same irrespective of how much you produce. So you better produce a lot so that you can distribute these high costs over a large number of products and make the products affordable. Now, but if you do that, then you have a cost advantage and a price advantage over your competitors. And a good example is the Ford Motors Company when they introduced the assembly line in the early 20th century. Uh, they invested a lot, obviously, into introducing this technology. Their productivity shot up through the roof, so they went from 12,000 cars per year to 900,000 cars per year. That's almost a 90-fold increase. The cost dropped, and they transfer a part of this cost drop to lower prices. So the price that they charged for a car went down from $900 to about $400. Now, what does this mean? Well, against a smaller competitor, you have a far bigger market presence, you have a cost advantage, and you have a price advantage. Once you get that, in the next cycle, you'll have higher profits, higher revenues, more ability to invest in technology, brand, post-production services, and so on and so forth. So that's one advantage. There are huge cost advantages to being big. Uh, the second advantage is access to finance. There is research here in the UK surveys that show that big firms consistently say that access to finance when they want to grow is less of a problem than small firms say that. That's quite simple. A big firm has more revenue, more ability to take on risk, more ability to bear a loss if something goes wrong than a small firm. Obviously, if they need bank loans or something, they'll be more secure and they will more easily get loans. That's why government programs always give credit to SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises. You don't see many programs, at least not officially, uh, giving, uh, supporting big firms. So you have easier access to finance when you want to grow. Third, economies of size. There are simply some things that you cannot even remotely undertake if you're small. Think of developing uh, a new commercial jetliner. I think Boeing invests about 20 to $30 billion to develop the Dreamliner. If, if you don't have this sort of money, you're just not in the market. But there are a large number of other such costs that aren't necessarily in the range of 20 to 30 billion, but they can easily be in the range of 50 or 100 million. That's already way above what most firms can afford. And there are various other advantages, as is mentioned already, brand recognition and so on. So essentially, as you grow, you gain advantages over smaller competitors, and this accumulates over time. Now, this means that the only firms that can compete against you are firms that have similarly managed to grow to a large size, and in this process, mop up, buy up, or outcompete a large number of small firms. So, what you get is a completely. Okay, and just one more thing to mention it's not just these natural advantages that you have with being big. Once you get big, you have market power of your suppliers, of your customers, and so on. You can employ lots of tactics to prevent, for example, you see a small firm that might become a competitor, but there are tactics you can employ to block them from ever growing. For example, if you have a cost advantage, and they come into the market, and they have a higher cost than you, okay, but the price is big enough for them to be profitable as well. You can lower the price of your products, because you have a cost advantage, you'll still be profitable, but the price might not be high enough for them to make a profit. It's called no entry pricing, and it's actually done. So essentially, what you get in any market where there is an advantage to being big, which is any advanced market, any highly technological market, very quickly, even in the span of 10, 15 years, 
you get what's called oligopolization. So the market becomes dominated by a few very large firms. And again, there is plenty of evidence for this. So in the UK, uh, don't know if you know, but there are about 25 million people employed in the private sector, and there are about 5 million companies in the private sector. Now, 6,500 of those have 250 or more employees in their country this big. These 6,500 employ 10 million people. The remaining 14, 15 million is employed by 5 million companies. Most of those companies don't even have employees, they're just only proprietors. Similarly, those 6,500 firms have a bigger turn of turnover than the remaining 5 million. And you see that in every capitalist market. Uh, in the US, for example, one, one thing that I can think of now is there are about 21,000 firms producing food. 50 of those firms out of 21,000 hold a 50% market share. So it's concentrated beyond what we normally can think of. Now, how does this impact markets? Well, we normally think of markets as these small firms jostling for, for, for uh, market share and you know, being influenced by the price and so on. Actually, that's not the way it works. Because big firms do not compete through prices. Because if you're a big firm and you try to attract customers by lowering the price, everyone will know about this and you'll have the capacity to meet the increased demand. Which leaves your competitors with no other choice but to reduce their own prices. And once they've done that, you're back relative to each other, back where you were, except to lower level of revenues and profits. So you don't do that. They avoid price wars, either tacitly or explicitly they agree. That's illegal, but they do it anyway. How do they compete for that? Well, Joseph Schumpeter, uh, a very important economist, uh, wrote in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy in 1944, because this isn't a new phenomenon. Markets have been only globalized for, for decades and decades. He said, but in a capitalist reality, as distinguished from its textbook picture, it is not price competition which counts, but the competition from the new commodity, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization. Competition which commands a decisive cost or quality advantage, and which strikes not at the margins of the profits and the outputs of the existing firms, but at their foundations and their very lives. This kind of competition is as much more effective than the other as bombardment is in comparison with forcing a door. So essentially, you compete by trying to have a decisive cost advantage or by introducing a new product and destroying your competitors. Okay. Uh, so now we know that firms can grow to enormous sizes and we know that markets, capitalist markets, function very differently than we normally assume. They function around big firms engaging in non-price competition. Uh, and in the process, improving technologies, reducing costs, improving products, and so on. There's, there's the negative side of that as well, the power of these firms, the pollution, and so on. But for now, let's focus on, on, on the broader set, let's broadly say positive. How does this then relate to development and specifically regional development? Well, you already had lectures about development, so I'm not going to go into that. But you know that development is tied to productivity increases. So you need to improve technology to produce more, to employ more people, to have more backwards and forwards linkages, to uh, export, etc., etc. And this is quite sector specific, so not all sectors of the economy are able to do this. And it just so happens that those sectors that are able to do this are those sectors where you need to invest a lot in technology to improve it. Which are exactly those sectors that are dominated by big firms. So you see that there is a complete link between what big firms do and how they compete in development. So big firms, in the way they compete, create new technologies, reduce costs, increase productivity, and so on. And this is actually economic development. It's not the only part of it, uh, but it is a very important part. So, and there is the book by Big Business and the Wealth of Nations by Chandler Kikino and you'll see, I forgot the name of the third author, which follows the role of big firms their competition, also the support they got from their states uh, in the development of advanced capitalist countries, although they cover centrally planned economies and so on. It's, it's a book from 1991. Okay, so regional development. I, I did warn you that this is just a geographical aspect of all of this. So how does this relate to regional development? Well, there are two things we have to keep in mind for, to understand this. One is there is a flip side to this picture of oligopolistic competition. On the one hand, you have firms that have won out in this competition, have grown big, efficient, cost efficient, 
uh, etc. Employ a lot of people, pay taxes, and so on. They can pay high, at least can pay high wages. On the flip side, you have firms that have lost out, that have been relegated to the sides of the market, the margins of the market, that are barely holding on, and so on. This is one aspect. There's a flip side to this. The other aspect is there is a geographical aspect. I've talked about this kind of without talking about space, but actually all of these big and small firms have their factories somewhere, have their offices somewhere, have their branches somewhere, whether they're production or, or service firms. Okay. Now, even if you were to assume that you know when some market is emerging, firms are new small firms emerge evenly spread out throughout the entire geographical space of the country. That's already a wrong assumption. It's not going to happen. But even if you were to assume that. After a while, some of these firms would come out on top, others would lose out. And those regions that have been unlucky to be with the firms that lost out would end up having smaller firms, less efficient firms, less employment, less taxes, less linkages between firms, and so on. The other side, those regions that ended up with big firms will be at an advantage. And this isn't just, again, I'll, I'll show some empirical data on this for the UK, because that's what my PhD is focused on. So you remember from the beginning, uh, sorry, uh, just before this, you remember from the beginning that basically the southeast, east of England where we are, and the greater London area, they're approximately the more developed part of the UK. Then you have a desert in between <coughs> that, basically. Well, not completely, but a desert in between that and Scotland. And some areas are particularly poor, such as uh, parts of Wales, northeast, Cornwall, and so on, uh, when they went into industrial decline in the 80s, when they lost most of the industry. So, yeah. Uh, I would like to go back to something you said uh, just a minute ago before going to the regional uh, geographic aspect. So, is there any chance you could hold that question for another three minutes? Because that's how long it will take to finish this. Okay. And that I can answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you look at the UK, first we can look at where the big firms are located. This is the size of, of the firms uh, by number of employees and the area where they are. We can see that the London Southeast, Southwest, to an extent, and East of England. Uh, they have more firms in any category, uh, those with no employees, so that's only proprietors, small, medium, large firms. Now, large firms are rounded, I mean, everything is rounded, but since there are only 6,500 large firms in the UK, and you divide it with a fairly huge population in London, and you come to number per 10,000, you come to number two, obviously implies there are quite a lot of firms there. And obviously, since this is rounded, there is a huge difference between, say, the southeast and the northeast. So big firms are located uh, in, in at least their headquarters, but obviously in a lot of cases their production plan or their offices are there as well, uh, are located in the more developed part of the UK. And we can talk about many of, of uh, many consequences of this. I've only chosen to look at research, the investment in research and development, because investment in R&D is a key element in uh, oligopolistic competition. Now, this is the top 1,000 firms in the UK by R&D investment. Mind you, that's top 1,000 out of 5 million. These top 1,000 invest about 60% of all of the UK investment in R&D. But of these 1,000, those with sales of over half a billion pounds, so there are 187 of them, and those with over 5 billion, there are only 54 of them, they invest about 85% of all of this. So they invest 85% out of 60%, which is a bit less than, a little bit more than half. So we have 250 firms in the UK investing about half of all the, out of 5 million, investing more than half of all the UK R&D investment. Actually, th these are really the important ones, the 54 ones. Okay. Now, unsurprisingly, if you look at this per region, the share of the Southeast, the population share is 13, GDP share is 14, but R&D is 23. The east of England, where we are, uh, population share. This is though all admittedly total R&D. This includes the government as well, but you still get the same picture. Population share 9, GDP 8.5, but these two things will be 17. London is approximately the same, but that's because a lot of firms <coughs> there aren't really uh, capital in, uh, R&D intensive, and the Northwest is basically Manchester. But in total, there's a huge disbalance. This has huge consequences. This is just some of it, but this has huge consequences because it's not just uh, you know, jobs for researchers, it's jobs for all the firms that supply everything that's related to research, it's all the production services and everything else that's related to this, and this is just R&D. We could then further look at lots more data on employment, you would see huge employment disparities, life expectancy, and so on. And this is in part, 
because this is where the strength of the UK economy lies. The flip side is where it doesn't lie, you live less, earn less, and so on. Now, there are mechanisms that maintain these disparities once they're in place. One, migration. Uh, people will tend to move uh, to where it's more developed, obviously no one's going to pack up and go to, to a village around Newcastle, but they're going to come here. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's one of the cities that suffered the worst, and Newcastle is actually quite okay compared to the surroundings. London is an anomaly but because people are moving out of it because of the ridiculous rent and everything, but that's a phenomenon of the last 10 years. But a lot of them are actually moving to the southeast, to the east, to basically just to get outside of it and then travel for three hours to get in. But northeast, northwest, Yorkshire and the Humber and so on. And of course, it's not just economics, but you can in principle see a shift of population. And if you look at data for the entire EU, for example, you see a clear depopulation happening, say, in the east of Germany and so on. So this is a clear thing. Of course, this means that young people leave, educated people leave, which makes the poor regions even worse off. Create some problems for the richer regions as well, such as <coughs> population, but far less than the problems for the poor ones. And just a few more graphs, obviously this is then seen. This is of everything that households uh, earn, how much they earn on their own, and how much do they get from charities, the government, and so on. So above 80% the Greater East, then as I said, you have a desert which goes even down to 70 or less in Wales and so on. So basically, it has to be topped up by charities and the government. Then you have Scotland, which is doing rather well, and Northern Ireland, about which if I don't even want to talk about. Taxes paid because of progressive taxation. Uh, again, of everything you earn, how much do you pay into taxes? Again, you see the Southeast, and then you see it declining, especially in some areas that have been particularly hard hit by the loss of mining. Mirror image of this, of everything the households earn, uh, how much do they get from other sources and how much do they earn on their own. And you can see that in Wales, it's uh, about a quarter of everything the households earn uh, is given to them by someone else. Whereas in the greater east, you have, uh, what, so uh, below 50. Of course, there's more nuances to this. Uh, obviously, not everyone alone has some pockets of extreme deprivation. Uh, but yeah, these are just some, this is just some data. You could go on and on and on with regional data and it will all show exactly the same picture. Uh, and thank you for your attention. These are some of, uh, some of the things that I could suggest reading, particularly all in this capital versus the region and, well, everything here, actually. And thank you for your attention.